Good to see you, everybody. Today I'm going to talk about delegates. Um, and uh, this is an intermediate, no, it's a, it's a beginners to intermediate uh, level talk. I have no idea if it actually is. But I'm not going to cover the, like, the advanced topics of actually implementing delegates. I'm going to focus on uh, how they are used, uh, basic usage, uh, and how we use them uh, extensively inside of InclueOS. So my name is Alfred. I'm the CTO of uh, InclueOS. It's a library operating system. So uh, most of you should know that already. If you don't, you can look at this black screen right here. <laughs> Uh, it's flickering a little. Uh, hopefully, that's not going to be a recurring problem. OK. So um, I wasn't, uh, I, I actually got into this uh, whole idea of using delegates when I was uh, starting to implement or design Include OS, uh, and in particular the IP stack, uh, back in roughly 2014. So what I was looking for was a way to uh, achieve complete isolation between layers because I'm making an IP stack and the RFCs are pretty strict about that. You're supposed to isolate. Um, I, I talked yesterday about layers. Uh, I don't think you can have hugely long, horizontal, clean layers, but you can definitely have isolation between the protocol handlers uh, inside the IP stack and, and, and that's a, a good way, I think, to, to design it. <coughs> So I was trying to fulfill all these requirements. You know, how can I pass a network packet from Ethernet up to IP4? I don't want any of those classes to know about each other uh, because that makes it more flexible. Um, I also need to have state in both. Uh, you know, so so for example, I might have four or five IP stacks. Um, so they can't be just a global. I just can't keep global state. Um, ideally, I also want to be able to rewire during runtime. And the main reason for this is that if you make something very hard coded, uh, you've seen these object hierarchies, I think it's really hard to get right. And I was absolutely certain I wasn't going to get it right the first time. Uh, so I thought, you know, let me just implement one class at a time, make a flexible system for wiring them together later, and I can actually make different versions of the IP stacks with different types of wiring, etc. And also the hard requirement, zero overhead. So possibilities we could use, or we could consider function pointers. Uh, you could pass the state around. I think that's what Linux would do, or, or, or any C program. Uh, just have normal functions and then pass the state as probably the first parameter in a struct, uh, or something like that. Um, but you know, I, I don't think it's a very nice uh, object-oriented solution. Um, <coughs> Uh, I could. I was considering std function. I was looking at that and getting to know that. Uh, this is back in uh, when I was new to new C++, uh, and uh, I couldn't find a way to make them point to member functions, because that would be. I had this clear idea. You know, if I could just point to a member function, you know, then the state could actually be maintained inside of that uh, instance of that object. Polymorphism, that's overhead. Uh, might not be that much uh, overhead, depending on how you design it. I'm not uh, completely against polymorphism. We use it some places, but we, just don't, we try to avoid it in really, really hot paths. And networking, passing packets up and down, you know, that's, that's some of the hottest paths uh, we have inside of InclueOS. <clears throat> so Google, right? That's what we do. Uh, I, fi I found this uh, article, uh, it's called Member Function Pointers and the Fastest Possible C++ Delegates. So this is an old article, it's from 2005. It was uh, written by Dan Clugston, Don Clugston. Um, and it's really uh, impressive amount of detail in there and it really explains what is actually a member function pointer. Anybody familiar with that? You, can, can anybody just right off the bat write a pointer to a member function? Okay, you guys are, you guys are good at that. Um, the syntax isn't, you know, it's not perfectly intuitive, but you know, it's 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 good. This is a good introduction introduction to to how you can deal with them. Uh, before C++, uh, this uh, this was made before C++ eleven, so lots of macros in there, and that's you know not an optimal solution. Um, so I kept looking. 
One guy uh, made something that was more standards compliant, uh, not using macros, um, but it had severe limitations. Um, as far as I could see, uh, you'd have to make a separate, uh, uh, separate version of, uh, uh, of the delegate for each of the function signatures. This was before, uh, before the variadic uh, um, templates, etc. So, you know, but it was something, and then Google a little bit more, and then you finally found, I finally found this, uh, which is impossibly fast delegates in C++11. Uh, you scroll down on that page, it's, it's a nice read. Uh, people are super excited and they're saying uh, it's faster than std function and it's, uh, the, the speed and the performance is actually identical to calling via a pure function pointer. So no instantiation of an object, uh, not calling via via. It's, it's as fast as calling via a, a single uh, C function pointer. Uh, I did some measurements myself and, and I found that to be the case as well. Uh, the difference isn't huge, but but I noticed uh, you know we had identical um, performance to to um, uh, calling via normal function pointer. So copy paste, right? So that was the first uh, delegate implementation for Include OS. Uh, I said last year as well. I owe the person a beer who who implemented this. Uh, this was really a good uh, uh, you know starting point for us. Um, that po that person never made contact. Uh, you know. If you know the person, or if you are that person, please uh, let me know and we'd buy you a drink. So let's look at how we use them. And start with the basics. Uh, so this is a very trivial example. I'll get to more interesting examples in a while. Um, we have a nice std function-like signature. So we're just saying delegate. Okay, so that's not optimal for the example. I'm saying decal type to just get the the, the type of, uh, of function one, but you could, you could just specify any function signature you would like, exactly like you would std function. Um, and then, you know, it's compatible mostly with uh, std function, so in this case I'm actually assigning the delegate uh, to std function, which I'm again assigning to, to pointer function one. So this is a trivial example, I'm just pointing to normal, normal functions now just to get started. And it has a call operator, so you can call it like, just like you would call a normal function. Um, if you call it when it's initialized, it's much nicer than a uh, function pointer. Uh, it's actually going to check for null pointer and it's going to throw an exception. So that's nice. And the output from here, you can see first we're calling function one twice and then we're uh, calling function two twice. So we actually assigned the delegates and the std functions to two different functions and, and we could change where they were pointing, pointing during runtime. So that's kind of promising uh, for, the, for, for the modularity and the flexibility that we were looking for. Uh, lambdas, there are no surprises here, uh, or uh, not really. Um, I'm saying auto func and then I'm creating a lambda here. Um, and uh, in, the, in the case of the delegate, I'm actually specifying the signature of the lambda, lambda and then I'm specifying the body of the lambda and I'm calling both of these um, and you know, the results are exactly as you would expect. Um, some slight things you might notice. Uh, if you say auto and this function, it turns out you can't reassign because it uh, defaults to const. Uh, with delegate, obviously, you can't use auto because auto would resolve to, and if you say auto and the std function signature, that would resolve to a std function and not to a delegate, obviously. Uh, are you with me so far? This is okay. This is completely trivial, right? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm keeping my promise of making this uh, a beginner level talk so far. So let's do the more interesting part and actually uh, delegate stuff to member functions. And for this example, I'm making a neuron. You guys are familiar with neurons? They are the tiny little cells inside of your brain. Uh, so if you look at that little, little tree structure there in the center, uh, that's the, the, the center of the cell, um, the cell body. Um, it will receive electronic pulses uh, at the bottom, I think, and it will build up a charge inside the cell body. Once it reaches a certain threshold, uh, it will actually fire to all of these terminals uh, up the tree there. 
So that's essentially how, you, how your brain is wired, right? So we'll make a tiny, tiny little brain for this example. So we can look at the implementation. Um, I'm, I'm now I'm specifying the type of a delegate. So I'm saying that the delegate I want for actually having one neuron fire to the next neuron, it's actually just a, a function that doesn't return anything, but it takes an integer as a parameter where the integer represents the charge I want to transmit. Um, and then I have the actual delegate member. This is a public member. I don't know if I'm breaking any core guidelines here, but for the sake of example, it's, uh, it fits nicely on the screen when you don't actually just have a, a setter for it. But the point is that you want to be able to wire the neuron from the outside. So I want to be able to say this neuron connects to that neuron, and that neuron connects to that neuron, and it's around build up kind of a, a structure uh, in that way. <laughs> So this is the algorithm for receiving an impulse. I'm uh, incrementing my charge, uh, and then you know if the charge, uh, the total charge for my neuron now uh, is above my threshold, or if above and equal or equal to my threshold, and if I actually have a delegate to a next neuron, uh, then I'll uh, actually just call that delegate, and I will send my charge. And, and I'm actually I'm removing some of the charge here because we, you can imagine it costs a little bit. Uh, to, to I, I can't imagine in your brain every time a neuron fires that, that it just keeps, that, that all the electric ch uh, charge just stays there. Uh, I'm guessing there has to be some loss uh, in, in, uh, along the way. So is it okay? It's a simple program. Uh, so let's make a little brain. So. Here we instantiate three neurons, neuron one, neuron two, neuron three. Of course, these are very simplified. A normal neuron would have hundreds or thousands of connections, but this, these ones have only one, so they're very simple neurons. Um, so we instantiate, and this is how you wire them together, and this is actually how you uh, assign a delegate to point to a member function. <clears throat> so I'm saying that uh, neuron one has a fire target. I'm assigning uh, the fire target of neuron one to uh, neuron two. So I'm specifying first the instance I want to point to and then uh, the address of the member function. Okay? And the same goes for uh, neuron two. Uh, I'm assigning neuron two to fire towards neuron three. And then I have a small little for loop where I'm firing pulses, but I'm only firing pulses at the first neuron. Okay? So the idea is that I want the the firing to happen into neuron one, and I want it to build up a charge after a couple of firings, and then it's supposed to fire to the next neuron. That's supposed to build up a charge, and that, and then that is going to build up a charge and fire to the last one, etc. <clears throat> the result is like this. So it's as expected. The first pulse, uh, the first neuron reaches a charge of 50. That's half its capacity. Um, so nothing more happens. Uh, pulse one happens. The second pulse. Um, and then uh, N1 reaches its threshold and it fires. Um, and now N2 is charged up to 50 and, and so on and so on. Uh, and at the very end, you can see that uh, the third neuron finally also reaches its capacity, but it doesn't have anywhere to go. So it, I guess it just keeps its electric charge until it blows up or something. Is it okay so far? So we're making a tiny little neural network out of delegates uh, wiring neurons together using delegates. So rewiring these during, down, uh, during runtime, that's interesting. That was a requirement I had. I, I thought that was kind of a, I, I thought I could see use cases for that, and we're going to look at an actual use case for that in Include OS uh, later. So what I've done now is added another class. So I think it's one of the things I like the most about these delegates is that it doesn't know about what kind or what type of class it's pointing to. It only knows about the signature. Have you noticed? I never told the neuron that it was actually ha having a delegate that was supposed to point to another neuron. It was just a delegate pointing to a function signature that had a void return and a integer parameter value. Okay? So that's really cool. You can wire these any way you like as long as the function signature matches. And in terms of information hiding, I think that's really great. You know, it means you can make really, really isolated components. All they have to do is, you know, they have to know about the signature of the one they're talking to. 
So this is a completely new class, but the function signature is the same. And I also named it differently just to make it extra clear. So now we have the initial wiring. It's the same as before. A neuron one fires to neuron two, neuron two fires to neuron three, but then now neuron three, it actually fires to this ground or to, to terminate or the, 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 the bucket at the end where you can actually take all the electric charge. Um, and more interesting is that, you know, we are doing this algorithm and we're sending the initial pulses and we're sending it only to the first neuron and it builds up, you know, and it, it spreads uh, throughout that neural network. Uh, but then uh, here we actually do a rewiring and we haven't restarted our program. So the programming is still running, uh, but now I'm saying that uh, neuron three should instead point to a completely new neuron that came out of nowhere. You know, your brain was so so lucky today, it actually suddenly got an extra neuron, uh, and, and uh, now neuron three actually connects to there. Okay, but then neuron four now connects to uh, the terminal instead. And the results are exactly like before. Um, so uh, it's a bit hard to see probably. I, mean, I think we are here just seeing that at the, probably don't, we don't get all the results, but uh, uh, at the end at least you could see that I've, I've woken up neuron number four. And neuron number four wasn't there uh, in the first iteration. Okay, so I'm still just doing all the firing towards neuron one, and neuron four suddenly was becoming part of this neural network during runtime. I think that's an interesting uh, observation. So there are completely anonymous, uh, for free, flexible object uh, coupling. I guess that's one thing you could use to describe it. Could we do this with the std function? Um, some people pointed out uh, stu uh, std bind. Uh, std bind has a way of uh, pointing, or uh, or uh, you can, yeah, you can have you can. You can create, what are they? Are they variables? Are they functions? You can create a function auto F3 here, and you can bind it to the member function of a class. Uh, but the interesting thing I said, because I said, what is it? You know, and, and it's actually interesting that the return value of bind is, it says that it's uh, a function object of unspecified type T. So that means you can't uh, assign it to a stud function. So, there might be some tricks here, um, but I didn't find any. I, I tried to assign it to a std function, and I wasn't able to. Um, so, and, and also, if you look at the signature, it's not nearly as nice, in my opinion. Um, I have, I have it's, it's nice for other use cases. I'm able to, for example, fixate uh, the parameters, uh, or fixate some of the parameters while leaving other parameters flexible. So in this case, I'm fixating the parameter 95, but I'm using a placeholder underscore one uh, for the last parameter, and then I'm calling it with only one parameter. So I've fixated the first parameter, and I'm, but the last have you know, kept flexible. So there might be some black magic or some tricks you could use to, to actually use, uh, use bind in this context. I haven't found it. Uh, these uh, Legos are smelling an opportunity. Uh, they want human brains now because I showed you now that I can make a neural network. Um, so maybe we should try to make a human brain. Um, yeah, it's hard to think with only four neurons. So we could try to do that. I was actually considering doing that for this talk, uh, but it turns out uh, you need 86 billion neurons to simulate a human brain, uh, and you need uh, yeah, I don't even know how to mention that number. Uh, it's uh, 0 0.15 quadrillion uh, connections, um, and that averages on f to uh, 1,500 connections per neuron. Uh, that means if uh, each of these neurons uh, needed 16 bytes each, uh, you would need 2.4 petabytes to store all of them. Um, if you had 16 gigabyte computers, you would need approximately 2.4 petabytes of memory, and you would need 150 thousands of these computers to store those <laughs> neurons. So that would be, that would uh, amount to approximately nine billion watts per machine, uh, but the human brain uses only 20 watts. I just thought that's 
quite interesting in case you were considering uh, making a human brain with these little techniques that I've, I've showed you. So I don't think that's viable. Um, um, yeah, so you're not getting the brains, unfortunately, but we can use this to implement an IP stack, and that's quite a lot more complex uh, than the little neurons I've made so far. It's not as complex as a brain, but it's, it's certainly a complex machinery. So let's look at how we are using uh, uh, delegates to wire the IP stack inside of ImcludeOS. And this is actually just uh, snipped from GitHub. You can go and see it's all open source. You can see how we're doing it. Um, and we are first, at the, at the top, I'm actually just making uh, all these delegates. So, so I'm saying that each of these protocol objects, they have a top and a bottom. Um, and I'm saying that the network interface, um, it receives an ARP packet uh, at the bottom. And uh, that ARP packet should then be delegated to the ARP handler. Um, uh, when the network interface sees an IP4 packet, because it investigates the Ethernet header, well then, you know, that uh, type of packet should be uh, delegated to uh, the bottom of the IP4 protocol handler. Uh, similarly with ICMP, with uh, UDP and with TCP. And then we go the other way back and down, uh, and, and we do the same type of wiring, but then for the return uh, path and also for the path where you actually initiate uh, packet creation uh, inside of your own machine. <laughs> so one interesting thing, uh, I, I thought it was very uh, um, hard to decide when I made ImcludeOS, uh, should I do context switches right off the bat? Should I start with threading? Uh, that, it's not obvious that you shouldn't, but I thought it's nice to see how far you can go uh, with only one thread. Um, so I'm going to just briefly uh, look at how these delegates uh, work in a, in a callback-based uh, system. So this is the event tree. Uh, this is actually showing a, a graphic representation of the wiring I showed you in code. So this shows you how uh, all of these uh, protocol objects are connected together using delegates. And remember that I can rewire these anytime during runtime. Right? And it's also very easy for you if you think that you want an IP stack where you don't need HTTP or you don't need TCP or you don't even need ARP. Uh, you're making a completely different IP stack. All you need is to make a new uh, small um, um, wrapper object like this, uh, uh, the INET internet object that I, I showed you code from, where you actually rewire it uh, differently to your own tastes. So what's interesting here is, is that the full event path uh, and, and now I'm, I'm trying to, to, to address the question of uh, how callbacks and uh, async uh, works uh, as opposed to, uh, to preemptive uh, multitasking. And, and it's interesting here that when we have used these, uh, these uh, delegates, the full path of all these events is already laid out in memory from the, from the get-go. Uh, and it's also then possible to create new paths uh, during runtime. So, uh, at the bottom, you'll see an interrupt happens. And, and that's why I, th I find this quite natural for the computer to, to actually work in this way. Because if you don't have a classical operating system kernel that's doing multiprocesses in between, we're just putting these delegates directly on top of the interrupts. Okay? So if you think about what happens when you receive, uh, when you click on uh, includeos.org and you receive the web page, What's happening? I mean, it's a sequence of, event, of events. It's a cascading sequence of events uh, where a lots of smaller events happen in the sub subsystems, and they are actually building up state quite like the neurons. <clears throat> so I've tried to you know, represent this by having a thicker arrow for the delegates that have been called more often. Um, uh, and, and we're now imagining that I'm receiving a network packet uh, on the network interface, that's triggering uh, an uh, interrupt handler. And now, of course, we have a choice um, um, whether we want to uh, preempt, uh, preempt the driver and actually say that, you know, to, to call the driver and force the driver to actually fetch our packet and handle our packet, or if we just uh, go up to the event manager, which is what we are doing by default, and just uh, set a little flag saying that this interrupt has happened, so I will need servicing, and that whenever the event loop gets back to you after having handled its previous event, uh, it will then actually 
call a delegate. And you see these blue lines are, uh, with the rings at the, at the end. Uh, I'm using those to represent delegates. So the event manager knows that the interrupt has happened, and it calls a delegate to the driver that has subscribed to that particular event. Um, the network driver has a delegate pointing to the Ethernet object. The Ethernet object has then a delegate pointing to the ARP handler. So that's the first packet you're, you're likely to see if you, have, hadn't boot, if, you, if you recently booted your computer. So the network gateway who wanted to send you this uh, uh, response from Google, it would you know, f ask you who, uh, uh, what your MAC address was, etc. But then we traverse the path and we go up to the IP4 handler, not much state in there. But when you get to TCP, there's a buildup of state. So there will be a first packet uh, that you will be getting, or depending on who initiated the connection, assuming they're initiating the connection, you'll first get a SYN packet, you'll answer with a ACK packet, and then you'll get a SYN ACK packet. And that means several events are happening in this system, uh, subsystem, quite like uh, with a neuron example. I'm building up state inside of TCP, and TCP then might start reading, uh, or actually it's uh, now, in this case, the HTTP is uh, subscribing to events from the TCP uh, connection, and, uh, and uh, the HTTP handler is going to start reading, and not until it reaches the point where it has actually received a full HTTP request is it, going to, is it actually going to trigger something to happen uh, up in user space. Yeah. So on this next slide, I've tried to show that I've kind of heated up uh, the, the protocol objects that have received the most attention. So these has, uh, these, some of these objects has, have gotten more packets than other, and you can see that TCP is uh, probably the hottest one in terms of state. It's keeping up a lot of state and building up a lot of state. So, so if you look at uh, callbacks as, as lambdas, uh, uh, that they are nesting lambdas inside of each other, you know, then um, it doesn't feel like it's very natural for the computer, but if you think about callbacks as delegates that you're wiring like this, I, I think it feels quite natural for the computer, actually. Um, when it comes to performance, this is also one other reason why I, I think it's a good idea to start with a callback-based asynchronous uh, system. It turns out, or actually this, this is from John Bandela, he, he did a talk last year where he did some performance measuring, uh, really interesting talk. Uh, and he was comparing callbacks versus Go uh, channel versus uh, boost fibers uh, versus uh, student futures. And the results were quite grim. Uh, callbacks uh, were really hard to beat. But everybody agrees that you know, callbacks aren't great and I'm going to get to an example where it really, really gets messy even with the delegates. So my, our assumption is that you know, the zero overhead choice, which is what we're looking for all the time, uh, that the zero overhead choice is to start with a callback-based system. There is no context switches. There is nothing else going on. I'm just following the path laid out by these delegates, and that's all I'm doing. Um, but uh, our assumption is uh, that uh, you know, uh, having channels or something similar built on top of stackless coroutines is probably going to be uh, an equally performant alternative with, with probably, uh, in many cases, a more intuitive uh, way to program. So it's not always smooth sailing, and uh, this is an example of that. Uh, I'm going to get dizzy uh, trying to explain this. Um, so we're using a lot of delegates here, uh, and, and, and the, the, what we're trying to achieve uh, is to transfer file A from connection B chunkwise when both the producer and the consumer are callback-based async. Okay, so, so that's when it gets kind of hard. When you have all these linear event paths, it's quite easy. When you just try to make loops in that event tree, uh, it, it uh, turns out it's much harder. Might be some new abstractions we can use, but so far this is something we came up with. <laughs> So this is, I, I didn't implement this, uh, a couple of kernel develop, developers on our team did. Um, so essentially you start by making a lambda, um, and you have a, a shared pointer to this uh, lambda uh, that will function as a sort of a job controller. Uh, and you have to then keep in mind that everything is async, so you can't preserve anything on stack. The, the stack frame goes, uh, it gets destroyed the moment this function returns. Um, and actually, 
uh, yeah, so, but you can, you can pass stuff in. So we're passing in, um, we're preserving a weak pointer to itself inside of this lambda. Uh, and then we pass, uh, we actually produce a shared pointer to ourself. And we, and then we, uh, we, uh, we do a call to the, to the read, uh, to the file system. We actually do that call, which is also async. So then we have to, um, uh, pass in the lambda that's holding a shared pointer back to this next, this original caller. And, and you can see this, this seems quite messy. Um, and you know, uh, if we're done already, then we return. Um, and it continues, um, you know, we pass a shared pointer back to next, to the consumer callback. When the consumer is done, it calls next, asking for the next chunk, completing uh, the actual loop. So. Um, I've made some graphics to try to explain this even better. Um, but as you can see, I, I don't think this looks linear or intuitive uh, in terms of programming. Um, yeah. So, and, 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 and all this algorithmic stuff, you know, it's really hard to keep track. Where am I? Uh, what, what, which part of the, the sequence am I in? Because it's absolutely not sequential when you have lambdas nested inside lambdas and nested inside lambdas. And, and then, of course, the actual starting of this loop uh, starts at the very bottom. <coughs> so, fortunately, the real brains are, are even messier. So, uh, these mouse neurons, uh, these are actually mouse neurons that have been uh, uh, generated, I think, automatically into 3D renditions of real neurons, and yours are even worse. And uh, I think uh, that there are also lots of loops in the real neural networks. I'm, I'm certain that in my brain there are lots of these feedback loops. And 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 yeah. so let's let's look at how this algorithm actually works. If we try to organize it a little and pull these neurons apart, um, and it doesn't really get much nicer, but what's nice is that, uh, well, essentially, this next, uh, that's the, the, a lambda that actually just uh, represents uh, a kind of job. And it holds a weak pointer to itself, and it able, it's able to, from that weak pointer, produce shared pointers to itself that it can hand to the producer and the con consumer, respectively. Uh, and what's nice about it, of course, is that once this whole shifting, uh, or once this whole loop is finished, uh, it will actually, uh, the reference count will eventually go back to zero. So there will be no more shared pointers pointing to this next function, and it will actually just disappear. So, so it's quite nice. You have all these events happening. At some point, you, you, you trigger, uh, you, you need to trigger uh, a transfer event where you're, you're trying to hook up a loop between two of these uh, various uh, events happening. And, and, and this is one way of doing it, but it's absolutely not uh, intuitive to read. Uh, it, it took me quite a while to actually just try to parse, to parse that code, because it's, in that sense, very different from how our brain works. So all of that would have been possible with a very simple uh, for loop, using stackful fibers and blocking, or blocking calls. So we're not arguing. We're not trying to convince everybody that the callback-based uh, solution is uh, uh, the perfect way to do it, but we think it's the zero overhead solution, the, the simplest, uh, least complex way to do it. And what's also interesting is that with our current solution, we are able to handle multiple thousands of connections concurrently with zero context switches and using only a single stack. And, and that's, I don't know any other way we could have done that. <clears throat> So if you don't like the algorithm I just showed you, if it puts you off, I mean, I don't, we don't run into that a lot. You'll run into, into it every once in a while where you, where you need this uh, solution where you have two async events that are supposed to be hooked together. But there's an interesting library called ELD, and that's built on top of uh, Boost ASIO. And this, this is a, a former, formerly it was a, its own company, it's now acquired by Docker. So they've built a really nice, uh, very, uh, they, they, their aim was to actually alleviate this or to remove this whole callback-based programming uh, paradigm. Uh, so they built something on top of Boost ASIO where, where everything automa automatically just uh, gets um, 
uh, fixed for you so that you can write your code very sequential. <laughs> And they have implemented Boost as your backend uh, for ImcludeOS so that they were able to run this library uh, on top of ImcludeOS. The, the, the integration isn't complete, but, uh, but uh, they have been able to, to do it. So, so then you can get stuff like this, where you just say you want to perform a HTTP request, and you say our, our finalize, uh, you know, you deserialize whenever it's done, and when you do finalize, that's, that's uh, yielding code, so, so it's a cooperative, uh, uh, multitasking, where it will just yield and then it's going to be a stack there that's going to be uh, switched out and something else is going to be switched in and uh, they have a whole scheduler system to deal with all that. <laughs> and of course, no callbacks. So even if we build a callback by system using delegates to connect stuff, uh, it doesn't mean we're stuck with that. Uh, you can have stuff like this on top. Uh, so. Let's take another look. This is the this is the typical thing you associate with callbacks. At least it, it was for me coming from, for example, Node.js. If you've ever used Node.js and looked at examples, you'll see a lot of this. And that's kind of, you know, you have level one of Lambda here, and then you have level two of Lambda there. And uh, the problem is that it looks sequential in the sense that it is syntactically sequential, but obviously uh, in, during runtime, this is not the sequence, necessarily the sequence of events. Um, so if you have, but if you're looking at it like this, I mean, we're essentially doing the same thing. Uh, you know, I'm saying I want to, I, I'm, I'm just saying that whenever, I, I've just actually phrased the name of the functions differently here. Uh, so what I'm saying is that whenever uh, TCP uh, wants to transmit a packet downstream, uh, uh, then just uh, then you want that that to go to IPv4 and, and not to the top of the IPv4 object. So so if you can if you have if it's possible for you to to instead of uh, nesting lambdas like that, but if, if it's possible if you do to use delegates and to have one uh, protocol object point to another protocol object, then it doesn't necessarily have to feel as async. And this is, of course, sequential code, uh, although the underlying system is completely uh, uh, asynchronous. So what's also nice, of course, is that these objects don't know anything about each other, except for these uh, delegate signatures. Uh, another really interesting and nice feature you get is uh, unit testing. So. Uh, in this case, we're actually unit testing the IP uh, part of our IP stack, uh, and this is something we're doing in Linux user space. So this is a snippet from our, one of our unit tests. So we instantiate a, a mock link layer. It's just a mock of, of, the, of the network interface card. Uh, and since it's using delegates, it's really easy to create that mock. Uh, and now we can build an, a full IP stack, instantiate a full IP stack on top of that network interface. <clears throat> and then we can rewire this IP stack for testing. Instead of rewiring it for actually talking to real protocol handlers, we can uh, wire it to call uh, mock protocol handlers. So that's what happens here. So you can see that uh, I'm setting the drop handler. IP has a drop handler. Uh, for example, it's getting a packet that's uh, where the source address is uh, broadcast. That's an illegal packet. Uh, you can't come from broadcast. You can send to broadcast, but not from. So IP has a drop handler that it's going to, by default, send packets to that drop handler so we, we can uh, keep track of how many packets are getting dropped and why. So we're making a mock drop handler now, and we're just saying, well, I don't want to do anything with this packet, except I want to, 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 uh, to increment the counter. And we can then make a expect drop macro on top of that. Uh, and now when I send a packet to the bottom of the IP stack, uh, completely synchronously, it will be just uh, dropped, and it will be, uh, the drop count is going to increment, and that means, uh, you know, uh, this unit test can then pass. So some <coughs> observation, delegating to a lambda, it allows you to pass state via capture clauses, which is what we used in the async for loop. I, I don't think uh, I was able to explain all the details in that async for loop, but it's, uh, it's not actually the purpose of the talk, but you can take a look. It's 
the, the point was that it's it's using delegates inside now using uh, lambdas inside of lambdas is uh, is not the easy or intuitive way to program. Um, and they can look deceptively sequential, although, although they're not. Uh, if you design as a tree of event paths, it's, it's, it, it might be simpler. It's not necessarily that you can always do it like that, but in our case, it was possible to do it like that, and it, it feels quite intuitive to work with. Yeah. So I'm uh, getting close to the end, but uh, I'm going to show you an example of something we can do with ImpluteOS, uh, where we can actually do something real here. So. Uh, this is from yesterday, uh, a simple web service, uh, and you can see that uh, we're using a simple HTTP server abstraction on top of our IP stack. Um, and the first thing you'll notice uh, is that uh, this is service start, and it's, uh, it's async in the sense that when, I, when service start starts, you're supposed to just exit right away. So what you're supposed to do inside of that service start is just to hook up events uh, or uh, to, uh, uh, well, hook up event handlers to events. Uh, and in this case, we are uh, hooking up a very complex chain of events uh, by saying that we want there to be an IP stack, and on top of that IP stack, we want there to be uh, an HTTP server. And now I'm using a normal callback system here to say that uh, when this server re receives a request, uh, you know, this is what I want to happen. I just want to to the response object that's being provided for me, where all the delegates going downward are wired uh, already from the HTTP response all the way down to the Ethernet network interface. You know, I want to write just some HTML uh, down, down that uh, return path. Um, and now I'm saying that I want the server to listen uh, to port 80. Uh, this is just a simple HTTP abstraction. Uh, and then the event loop exits. You boot minus minus create bridge dot, uh, and we get hello web. So I showed this yesterday, uh, no surprise. So yeah, this is how we do configuration. This is just an aside. Uh, we do configuration now outside of ImpluteOS and not inside of ImpluteOS. So if you have used ImpluteOS in the past and you have noticed that you, you had to do configuration in the code, we've changed that now. So we're actually now building the configuration into the binary, uh, but it's, it's that's much nicer for maintain, maintenance. So and that's also one of the reasons why we made a cleaner uh, abstraction um, below the link layer in order to be able to switch out drivers uh, without having to change code. So anyway, let's do something more interesting uh, using delegates to rewire. Um, so what I'm doing now is that it's essentially much the same uh, thing. But, so I'm making a web server, I commented some of it out uh, in order to fit everything on the, on the slide. But what I'm doing is that I'm uh, actually uh, now um, talking to the IP stack and I'm getting the network interface card uh, uh, object, which is also an Ethernet handler. And I'm saying that I want to reassign the IP4 upstream uh, to this new IP4 handler. And this new IP4 handler, just like in the unit test, in this case, is just a it's just a dumb function, right? But this means that uh, I'm able to now reassign how these delegates are uh, wired, and this is actually the way we would go about uh, implementing a firewall and hooking a firewall uh, into the IP stack. So you can do this, and then in this new IP handler, uh, you can see that it takes a it, it has to respect the signature. Uh, all these upstream and downstream delegates that we use for our IP stack, but essentially it just takes a, a pointer, to, or it's a, it's, a, it's a unique pointer to a network packet, and that unique pointer uh, is going to get moved into this function. So um, I'm also now I'm, I'm casting this uh, this uh, pointer, uh, so I'm doing a unique pointer cast. Uh, because I know that this packet is in fact an IP4 packet. This might seem strange to some of you that we do these typecasts, but there's actually that's actually how the packets, uh, how I think it's natural to, 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 to treat the packets. A network packet comes in and you actually have to investigate the type of the packet by looking at type, the, the type field in respectively the Ethernet header and then in the IP4 header. So 
you have the whole buffer already, but you don't know what kind of type it is until you are in runtime and you're actually inspecting the contents of that packet. So there might be other techniques we, we could have used, but we are now, we've made sure that we have safe ways of uh, doing typecasts. And, and I do have a guarantee from the lower level that uh, since I'm the IP4 handler, uh, they have already checked and made sure that this is in fact an IP packet, and that's why they called my delegate, because I was the IP4 packet handler. <coughs> So all I'm doing here, I'm not doing anything very interesting, but I am inspecting the actual packet and I am retrieving the IP address from outside, uh, from inside of that packet. So it's, I think that's also quite an intuitive uh, way to do it. We have packets and, and we have, that's just a completely normal class where you have getters uh, for all those different uh, fields in the IP header. Uh, what does it mean? 15 minutes, yeah, that's fine, thanks. Um, so uh, at the, yeah, so we're not doing much interesting here, we're just saying that, you know, we want to print out who this packet is coming from. Obviously what you could do here if you wanted a firewall was to just say, okay, let's look at this IP address and if it's from that person or that, that person, then we drop it. You could look at the, you could uh, in, again inspect what type of, uh, packet, this IP packet is, is, is it UDP or is it uh, TCP? And you could inspect the port numbers. Uh, so so you, could, you could actually go from here and build a complete firewall. Um, and at the end, what I'm doing is I'm just pushing that stack, now I'm pushing that same packet, I'm actually moving it uh, directly up to the actual IP handler of the IP stack. So now I'm saying I'm done with this packet and it's fine. I've checked that it's okay. Uh, I didn't drop it. If I wanted to drop it, I would just return and the packet would just go out of scope and be released, go back to its uh, buffer store. Uh, but in this case, I'm actually just pushing it back up to where it was, was supposed to go in the first place. So this is how uh, packets are being uh, pushed around in, in, uh, in ClutoS. And um, so let's see how it looks. Yeah, interesting though is that, that I'm keeping this server, right? Because I'm keeping, I'm, I'm keeping the path uh, from the NIC and all the way up to the HTTP server, I'm, I'm keeping that path intact. All I've done is to plug something in between, right? So in between the network interface card and the original IP handler, I've just plugged my own function in between so that I can lie there and, and, and inspect the packets. So the result when I boot is still a normal web server, but inside of the terminal, you will see that uh, it's actually printing out that it received packets uh, from the gateway, in this case, IP address uh, 10001. Yeah, that's actually all I had. Uh, there are a couple of more talks. Uh, there is one talk tomorrow by the guy who implemented our delegates. Uh, so uh, if you have questions about the implementation of the delegates, that's the guy to talk to. I don't know if it's, it's probably not going to cover that tomorrow, uh, but, uh, but you know, that's the guy to talk to. Um, uh, there's also one talk tomorrow by uh, one of our developers, Ingve. He's going to talk about two tools and techniques to stay up to date with modern C++. I'm going to go to that talk. I think it's hard to stay up to date. But uh, please come find us. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to take them. Any questions? No? I was curious, why did you choose to create packet pointer type as opposed to packet ID? You said that it guaranteed to be IP4, uh, you know, make that guarantee when you set that uh, delegate handler. Yeah. So what's the reason you use pointer anyway? Uh, do you mean for the packet? Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, the packet has actually come in in a predefined buffer. So the network, uh, the network driver actually has a buffer store uh, of pre-allocated buffers, and it has to have that because we use DMA. So that means the physical device is actually going to lift packets directly into my memory. That means I have to have already a data structure with buffers populated, and the buffers have to be appropriately sized for actually any type of incoming packet. So we use roughly MTU sized, usually they are 1500 bytes. You have to kind of pre-allocate those. So it's, uh, it's a bit complicated, but that means we have, we have buffers that are pre-allocated, they have been populated with data by the actual device, 
and then the natural way is to use some kind of pointer. We used to have a shared pointer because we thought we might need to have several copies of packets. There are places in the IP stack where you, for example, need to buffer. Uh, in uh, TCP, you're supposed to retransmit if the retransmit timer uh, fires. That means it hasn't gotten a response in a certain amount of time. So initially, we thought, you know, maybe we need to hold on to the packets. Uh, turns out there is uh, quite a lot of overhead with these shared pointers and passing them around. So, so we ended up figuring out that uh, most of these cases where we thought we needed to retain packets, we could actually solve that in a different way. So now we're just doing a unique pointer and we're moving that unique pointer so it, the packet that way moves from one protocol handler to the next. Anything else? Packet rates. I haven't measured packet rates. Uh, we have for one core. If you, I, I've me measured throughput roughly, and uh, it's in it's in the few gigabits uh, of throughput is, is what we can push through a single U uh, include OS a unikernel on a virtual machine with a single core. No. If you do I, we did iperf. I've done iperf. So we've also done uh, load balancing uh, experiments with uh, at least, I think, uh, 65,000 co concurrent connections, uh, thousands of connections per second, and it's quite fast. Obviously, when we're bound to, in, in the way we've, we're using it by default is that we're using a single core, but we do have, uh, we also do have access to several CPUs. Uh, we don't have high level abstractions for that yet, uh, but they're in, uh, in the making, and. Uh, on this conference in Germany, I'm going to talk about how we can actually do parallelism inside of ImpluteOS. Um, and there are several interesting uh, opportunities available to you uh, when you are in complete control of the, of the hardware. We uh, don't need threading. You can actually put functions directly onto cores, for example. Oh, interrupt context. Uh, no, uh, we can go back to the slide uh, about the event handler. Uh, we could choose preemptive. There are some things we do preemptively. Um, let's see, I think it was here. So when it comes in, you have a choice. I mean, of course, the interrupt actually pre preempts. It always does. There is no way around it. Uh, that, that's what an interrupt is. You, can, you, you can't prevent it from, from preempting. Uh, so, uh, what happens here is that there is a, a preemptive interrupt handler for IQ37, but it's handcrafted to do nothing, except marking, uh, setting a bit uh, that's available to the event handler, and we do that atomically. So that, so that means you don't actually have to do a complete context switch, because we ju you just write. Uh, you, you keep track of which registers you're actually clobbering and you're making a small, very, very easily maintainable and tiny, tiny little assembly function that just sets this byte, uh, sets this bit and then it returns uh, using IRET. Um, there are some things that we are doing preemptively, so we, you can do context switches. We are, for example, we have a, a stack sampler. That's quite interesting. If you, if you set a timer uh, to one of these interrupts uh, uh, using one of the timer features in the CPU or, or, or the, uh, one of the timers that are available. Uh, you, you can set an interrupt to happen uh, at, a, at a fixed interval. And um, now when you're preempting, you're on the same stack. So that's quite interesting because now you're, you're preempting, you're on the same stack and you can just investigate the stack frame below you and you know which function was running right now. So we demoed that. I think we showed it last year, but it's... Uh, it's, that's one of the things we are doing preemptively. And you know, from there, it's, it's, it's not hard to implement. You could easily put threading on top of there. I mean, we already have the context switching features, most of them in any case. But, it, but it, the complexity explodes, uh, obviously, when you do it. So our mission was to see you know, how much is it possible to do with this single-threaded, very strictly event-based uh, context. And then we are now you know, doing experiments with running, for example, uh, we are actually doing experiments where we have several CPUs and we are signing, uh, we are signing for example, TCP connections to individual CPUs where they can do TLS uh, decryption, etc., on, on uh, individual CPUs. So we're trying to avoid this classical context switching scenario. Uh, 
mainly because for virtualization, it turns out that uh, multi-threaded applications running in virtual machines perform much worse uh, compared to single-threaded applications uh, as opposed to when they're running directly on bare metal. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's uh, a way to do it. You can you can have um, yeah. I mean, it's it's that's that's one a possible way to do it. Uh, you, you but but there needs to be some kind of event handler on that other core, uh, and uh, I think you could implement something like a thread pool on top of there. So we've we've done experiments to similar to that effect where you have uh, different CPUs uh, are actually just fetching. Uh, connections from a shared pool. Uh, another way we have done it is to actually have uh, separate IP stacks running on different cores. <clears throat> so um, we, we have some interesting experiments and, and some results that we, we would like to share, but they're not ready yet. Mm -hmm. But the code is there, so, so you can go look. There are some examples of SMP uh, of running actually just a Lambda uh, on a separate uh, CPU core. You, you, there are examples of that in our repository. You can. Uh, how do you mean? So, like, if you have an existing delegate, can you just switch the object of delegates to without switching objects? Uh, switching just the object? Can't you do that? Uh, he's shaking his head. I mean, you mean you mean shifting? So, for example, if I have a TCP connection object, uh, and I want to switch the delegates from pointing to one object to another object, is that what you mean? But to the same function? Yes. Yeah, that should be possible. Yeah, because it uh, it holds a pointer to the to the to the object and to the function. Yeah, sure. You can write both again, yeah, but you have to switch. You have to write both again. Okay. You won't it's just the base the same time. Sure, I, I understand, but um, I'm, I guess I'm trying to figure out what this would do over just capturing your object in a lambda and then you know calling it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's exactly how it does it. Uh, other questions? I guess you know. Please just come up and uh, and talk to me if you if you have other questions. I'd be happy to talk. Uh, if you have other questions uh, regarding include OS uh, as well, uh, that's interesting. And and don't be shy to come into our chat room. I mean, uh, we really like to have people approach us and and connect with us, and you know, we'd be happy to help you if you're interested and curious. Also consider using Includer as just as a network library. It runs fine under usage-based Linux. Uh, you, we also have a project now where you can attach the whole IP stack on top of a, a Linux tap device. So that Linux has a facility where you can pull Ethernet frames directly off of, uh, out from the kernel without going through the Linux IP stack. So it's possible to use Includer OS in your normal process uh, as an IP stack and uh, many interesting uh, things you can do with that. Okay, I think I'll just say thanks and... Uh, <laughs>